Marcus Tullius Cicero Minor, Consul 30 BCE. The son of Rome's greatest orator, Cicero the Younger faced high expectations from his earliest days. Born just before his father's famous consulship, Cicero Minor grew up in the shadow of one of the Senate's greatest figures. Young Marcus, so far as we can tell, strove to please his father and to honor all of his wishes. However, Cicero Minor was not an intellectual and seems to have been something of a disappointment, despite his best efforts. Most of what we know about Cicero Minor is from his father's perspective, so the task facing us today is to try to tell Marcus's story from his own perspective. Due to the nature of our evidence, we know much more about Cicero Minor's early life than his years as a senior statesman in Rome. He was a close contemporary of Octavian and saw Octavian transform himself into Augustus and take Rome from the Republic to the Empire. Although it is common to dismiss Cicero Minor as an afterthought or as a lightweight, I will argue that he was actually a savvy and successful politician, even if he fell far short of his father's achievements. Further, I will argue that Cicero Minor is a somewhat tragic figure, as what little evidence remains suggests that he had considerable sorrows in his life and tried to bury them in his cups. This is the story of Marcus Tullius Cicero Minor, who was above all else a survivor who fought bravely for the people he loved and the causes he supported. When we think about the familial relations of Cicero Minor, one figure towers above all the others, and that is his father. Marcus Tullius Cicero the Elder was consul in 63, and by the time that young Marcus would emerge as someone who was old enough to really understand the world around him, it was already the case that his father was in the running for being the greatest orator in Rome's history. Young Marcus therefore had a lot to live up to, and so far as we can tell, Cicero the Elder was a pretty good father and was more or less supportive of his son, even if young Marcus was not quite on the same level as his father intellectually. Marcus's mother was Terentia. Most of what we know about her comes from the elder Cicero, who seems to have regarded her as a somewhat formidable and hard to approach figure. From the perspective of young Marcus, however, she most likely was far more warm. And so far as we can tell, Marcus's childhood was more or less a happy one where his parents got along and things were just fine. He had an older sister named Tolia. We don't know that much about the relationship between Marcus and Tolia, and there was a pretty significant age gap. Most likely they're about 14 years apart. And so they most likely were not all that close, but perhaps early in his life, Tolia was still living at home and may have looked after him and they developed a bit of a bond that way. Cicero Minor had an uncle named Quintus Tullius Cicero. He was a praetor, later served as legate under Caesar, and he wrote a famous tract on how to win an election. In some ways, Marcus the Younger was a little bit more like his uncle than his father. His uncle was a man of many parts who was not necessarily an expert in any one thing, and I think a similar statement could be made about Cicero Minor. He also had a cousin, the son of Quintus, also named Quintus, and the two of them were close in age. Quintus the Younger was perhaps a year or two older than Marcus. The two of them, however, were raised together as their fathers wanted to make sure that the two cousins were as close as they had been as boys. And so the two of them would spend a great deal of their child and teenage years together. It's also worth noting that in some ways, Quintus the Younger was more like his uncle, the great orator Cicero. So it's an odd dynamic that the family had but because they spent so much time together, they all had people that they could look up to and mentor or take mentorship from if you're looking at this from the perspective of young Marcus. As for Cicero Minor himself, he was born in 65 or 64 and he would have still been a toddler at the time of the Catalinarian conspiracy in 63. He was the second and final child of Cicero and Terentia. They had had a long drought in having children after Tullia, and then Marcus was born when Cicero at least was now in his early 40s, and this would be the final time that the great orator would procreate. <laughs> 
Members of the Roman aristocracy dreamt of attaining enough honor to equal or surpass what their fathers had achieved. Their families would press them to try to add luster to the family name and ensure that in the future, members of the family would continue to succeed and thrive in Rome. Cicero Minor had just as much pressure on him as anyone else, if not more, because his father, Cicero, was one of the most famous men of his generation and had come to be known as the greatest orator in Rome's history. Cicero's fame continued to increase while his son was growing up, so for Marcus the Younger, the bar kept getting raised over time. He also found that the various trials and travails of his father's career were something that affected him physically. So when Cicero went into exile, young Marcus, who was still in his formative years, was without a father effectively for a year or two. During the first triumvirate period, it was common for Clodius to direct violence against Cicero, and if he couldn't get to Cicero, he could make life unpleasant for Cicero's family. Young Marcus probably knew what it meant to be afraid of a mob. So from an early age, Marcus not only knew that he was destined to become like his father and deal with the, all of the same challenges, but it also became apparent to Cicero the Elder that his son would not go on to be one of the great orators of his generation, and that he would not go on to share his strong interest in philosophy and rhetoric. That does not mean that the younger Marcus couldn't be successful, however, just that he would not be able to attain the same level of success. And in his letters, we see that Cicero's writing about his son seems to indicate some fondness. He says when Marcus is a very small boy that he's very affectionate, and later on he talks about him being a good and dutiful son, but he does kind of see his son as being a bit limited in terms of his potential. Cicero spends more time talking about his relationship with his daughter Tolia and also his relationship with his nephew Quintus, who he sees as the more capable of the two Cicero boys. So while Cicero the Elder does not outright say that his son is a disappointment and most likely was affectionate and attentive, it's clear if you read his letters that he had a degree of favoritism for his daughter and his nephew. And whether Marcus knew about this or not as a kid is unclear. What is very clear though is that as an adult, when Marcus inherited his father's estate and all of his letters, he would be quite aware of how his father felt about where he stood in the hierarchy of the next generation. And I imagine that if he hadn't been aware of that before, it must have come as a rather painful revelation to realize that he was very much third in his father's affection. When we read about the fluctuating fortunes of great Romans, it's very easy to fall into the trap of only considering how these events impacted their lives without thinking about the people around them. The families and households of all these great Romans would be equally, if not more, affected by the various turns in fortune that afflicted the named figures in history. In the case of Cicero Minor, his father's fortunes did in fact take a turn for the worse around 59 or 58. By 60, Cicero's star was already fading. His consulship, while it had been seen as a smashing success at the time, had outworn its welcome, largely due to Cicero bragging excessively about it. He had bragged so much about his role in saving Rome from Catiline that even people who were inclined to agree with him politically had come to find him obnoxious. He'd even gone so far as to try to commission poets to write an epic about his consulship, a commission that no one was willing to take. Cicero eventually took it upon himself to write an epic, and this epic was a flaming failure. For all of Cicero's genius at prose and speaking, he just was not a poet. So Cicero was having to deal with all this failure, and he writes around 60 that while things are going badly in public and while there are increasingly rumblings about prosecuting him for how he handled the Catalinarian conspiracy, he said that things at home were still good and that he and his wife were getting along and he was enjoying spending more time with his young son, Marcus. But then the following year, or about two years later, so by 58, things had turned dramatically for the worse. The first triumvirate had been formed, and Clodius, who was tribune, used his powers to get Cicero exiled. Cicero had to leave Rome, and while he was away, his house was razed. 
so he no longer had a residence in Rome to go back to, and this meant that Terentia and young Marcus were also forced to leave Rome. Cicero tells us that his wife Terentia was frail at the time, and that he was concerned with his family, but most of the content of his letters is just filled with self-pity, talking about how he will never again enjoy the praise of the crowds that he deserves, and how he'll never again be able to stay in Rome and help make decisions and uh, achieve his destiny. We think, but we don't know, that Terentia most likely went to Arpinum, Cicero's hometown and possibly her hometown, and this meant that young Marcus would have a chance to get in touch with his roots. How young Marcus took all of this, we don't really know. He may have been a bit too young to really understand what was happening, or to understand the exact extent of the danger facing him. But most likely he was just old enough to at least perceive the danger, even if he didn't really understand any of the reasons behind it. We don't know all of the details of young Marcus's education, although we know quite a few of them. Presumably his first teachers were assigned to him in Arpinum, and his mother sought them out and hired them. Later on, when Cicero returned to Italy, he would have taken a strong interest in the education of his son, and so he began to take over that process. When Marcus was nine years old, Cicero hired the famous grammarian Tyrannio of Amesis to teach Marcus and his cousin Quintus. In general, Marcus would look after his nephew's education on behalf of his brother, who often tended to struggle with money. This was also because Cicero was very much dedicated to the idea of making sure that young Marcus and young Quintus grew up as the best of friends. In 54, after a couple years with Tyrannio, Cicero commented that the two boys had grown very close, that they were very happy, and that their education was generally proceeding well. He seems to have been pleased with Tyrannio's performance. However, there is evidence in the letters that refer to the early education of Marcus Cicero that his father had very much developed feelings of favoritism toward his cousin Quintus. Cicero says that Quintus not only looks more like him, but is the more clever of the two boys. The way he phrases it makes it seem like he is accounting for the difference in their age when he says that Quintus is the more clever of the two. So once again, if Marcus later in life was reading the letters from this time, he would see that the favoritism toward his cousin began relatively early. The elder Cicero was something of a townie. He didn't like to leave Rome unless he had to. If he did leave Rome, it was only to go to the countryside. So it came as a very unwelcome surprise to him when Pompey passed a bill requiring former magistrates who had not yet served as governor to do so. Rome had a shortage of provincial governors, and it turns out that on that list of men who had held a consulship or a praetorship and never been governor, Cicero's name was near the top. So 12 years after serving as consul, Cicero was selected to go to Cilicia and serve as the proconsular governor. This was not a choice assignment. Cilicia was a rough and rugged place. There were bandits there, and often it was prone to revolts. In order to make sure that he could do his job properly, Cicero determined that he would need the aid of his brother, Quintus, who was a seasoned soldier. Quintus had done well as a legate under Caesar in Gaul, and his services in Cilicia would be indispensable. In fact, in many ways, while Cicero was a nominal governor, it would be his brother Quintus who would do all of the actual work. As they traveled east, the two elder Cicerones decided that their sons should go to Cappadocia rather than accompanying them all the way to Cilicia. Not only was it safer in, in Cappadocia, but they were able to take up residence at the court of King Diotarus of Galatia. And not only could they continue their studies here and learn about Hellenistic court life, but this also meant that they were there as a form of insurance so that Diotarus felt comfortable sending his Roman pattern legion south to aid Cicero in his efforts to subdue Cilicia. So already, Marcus and Quintus, the younger ones that is, had impacted Roman politics in a tangible way by ensuring that this legion went to the aid of the Romans. We can see how close Cicero had become with his nephew by the fact that when it was time for young Quintus to have his coming of age ceremony and adopt a toga of manhood, uh, 
that the person presiding over the ceremony was his uncle, Marcus Tolley Cicero. We can also presume that young Marcus was present and that this would have been the first time perhaps that he had seen a ceremony like this. How he felt about his father lavishing so much attention on his cousin is hard to say, but if the two boys were as close as Cicero seems to think they were, then most likely Marcus was actually not jealous about this. On the way back to Rome, Cicero determined that the four Ciceroni should take a family trip together, and so he decided to take a break from Roman politics even while the crisis was brewing back in the West, and the four of them actually took a big detour to Rhodes, where Cicero took them on a tour of the place where he had studied as a young man. Perhaps he was trying to inspire his son and his nephew to want to go to the Greek world and study. This seems to have had little impact on either of them, as it would turn out. Marcus was set to don the toga of manhood in 49. However, all of the events of that year, and not just Marcus's coming of age, were very much upstaged by Caesar's crossing of the Rubicon and the outbreak of the Civil War. Most likely in the Cicero household, the blame was cast entirely at Caesar's feet. At any rate, the elder Cicero was quite beside himself with grief for the Republic, and he also saw this as something that would only end in disaster. He had predicted from this time forward that almost certainly Caesar would prevail over Pompey in the Senate. Nonetheless, a depressed Cicero the Elder took his son back to Arpinum, the family's um, ancestral home, and there Marcus celebrated his coming of age. Cicero said that the people there loved him and that it was a pleasant ceremony and that they had a good time. We don't know how good of a time it was for Marcus or how attached he was to Arpinum, although because he probably spent some time there as a child, he most likely did have a bit of affection for the place. Most likely, the biggest complaint Marcus would have is that his cousin Quintus wasn't there. Quintus claimed that he couldn't be there because his mother was ill. I'm sure Marcus accepted that excuse, but still, it would be a better coming of age if someone you'd spent your entire childhood with was there. After all, you'd been there for his coming of age, so it's a bit disappointing. But when it went from disappointing to perhaps infuriating is when Marcus and his father learned that Quintus had been absent not because he was visiting his sick mother, but rather because he was in Rome informing Caesar that his uncle was planning to go to Greece to join Pompey, a move that was explicitly forbidden. In Cicero's letters, it's quite clear that he is much more concerned with his nephew's betrayal and adherence to the Caesarian cause than he is elated by his son's coming of age. Nonetheless, Cicero did manage to use his influence as paterfamilias to more or less force his entire family to follow Pompey to Greece. Once he got to Greece, however, Cicero found that this was a source of yet more grief. He was not able to find a suitable command. The elder Cicero thought that he was worthy of at least a province and nothing like that was offered to him. Commands only went to people who were loyal optimates with fancy names. And so the elder Cicero sat around and griped and mostly was an annoyance to Cato the Younger who was governing at Dyrrhachium. As for young Marcus, his experience was quite different. He seems to have been an easy person to get along with, and he also seems to have made a lot of friends in the camp. He was even given command of a small cavalry unit. This was most likely a concession to his father, since his father clearly was not getting anything out of being in Greece. Young Marcus did well in this role and fought bravely at Pharsalus, even though we don't have too many details. After the battle, Caesar pardoned all of the Ciceronis and they returned as a group to Italy. And it's only here and now that we see young Marcus for the first time asserting himself as a politically active man. When Cicero the Elder was uh, considering rejoining Pompey despite having accepted Caesar's pardon, Marcus pointed out the folly of such an action and how it would bring about disaster on the family and even on Cicero himself. Marcus tearfully pled with his father and ultimately won his approval. Cicero decided to sit out the remainder of the Civil War. 
and to simply sit on the sidelines and wait for it to be over. Had Marcus not intervened, it's very probable that Cicero would have arrived in Africa and then been executed the second time he was captured. So Marcus, in many ways, not only did well in battle, but also proved himself to be a man who looked after the best interest of his father. By the summer of 45, it was clear that the civil wars were nearly at an end. By this point, Caesar only needed to finish off one more army in Spain under the command of Titus Labinus. The younger Quintus was growing restless in Rome and had always been a Caesarian at heart. And so he defied his father's wishes and joined Caesar's army that was heading for Spain. Marcus didn't want to defy his father and he knew how his father felt about Caesar. So he asked for his father's permission to join his cousin. Cicero, instead of simply refusing, instead relied upon persuasion. And he convinced his son that it would be dishonorable to fight on more than one side in the same war. He said, instead, you should take yourself to Greece and study rhetoric at Athens. This will better prepare you for the future career that you're going to have when you come of age. Marcus, for his part, does not seem to have been terribly enthusiastic about the notion of going to study. He was not a natural intellectual and does not seem to have been nearly so bookish as his father. He also had figured out by this point that he was far better on a horse than he was with a pen in his hand. Nonetheless, he decided that it would be best to obey his father, and so he decided to heed his father's advice, even if this was not necessarily where his heart was at. When he arrived in Athens, Marcus quickly proved himself to be active and enthusiastic, at least when it came to his social life. He was having quite a good time. His father was very much worried that his son would not take things seriously enough, and so he struck up an extensive correspondence regarding Marcus's studies. Of particular importance here is Atticus, who lived in the area and kept close tabs on Marcus's behavior. Atticus seems to have issued mostly positive reports about Marcus's conduct, and it appears that Atticus was very fond of the younger Cicero. Marcus was able to use his social skills, which seemed to have been much better than normal, in order to make friends with almost every student around him and also with most of his professors. He took to actually going to dinner with his professors, which seems to be a bit unusual. He seems to have gotten a little closer than normal to most of his teachers, perhaps as a way to make sure that they sent positive reports back to Rome. It was during this time that Marcus also showed an inclination to drink too heavily. And in fact, this had his father worried. Cicero, the elder, was so worried, in fact, that he explicitly forbade Marcus from associating with the rhetorician Gorgias, who was an especially notorious drinker. Despite his general lack of seriousness and how he elevated socializing above studying, Marcus did manage to make some significant progress as an orator. Cicero would read one of his letters and comment that his son had clearly been doing something right and that his teachers were clearly keeping after him to some extent. Soon thereafter, while Marcus was still in Rome, or still in Athens, excuse me, this was when Caesar was assassinated. And while in Athens, Marcus would come into contact with two of the assassins, including Gaius Trebonius and Marcus Junius Brutus, one of the most famous of the assassins. It's clear from all of this that even though his cousin was a Caesarian, young Marcus seems to have been fond of his father's politics and was certainly not a Caesarian. Cicero Minor was positively giddy with delight when he learned that Caesar had been assassinated. He very much shared his father's political inclinations and he became something of a fan and follower of Marcus Brutus. When Brutus arrived in Athens, ostensibly just to study and enjoy some quiet time, he quickly found that young Cicero wanted to be his friend, and the two of them seemed to have gotten along fairly well. Marcus the Younger seems to have been a pretty charming guy. He was also determined to do something material to aid the cause that he and his father believed in so fervently. And so as he monitored developments back in Rome, 
Cicero the Younger seems to have realized either on his own accord or because of his conversations with Brutus and others that Gaius Antonius' appointment to Macedonia could be a problem. While his colleague and fellow son of a famous orator, Hortensius the Younger, decided to refuse to hand over the province, Cicero the Younger, who was a little bit more military focused, decided that he wanted to deprive Gaius Antonius of military power. So he actually traveled to meet with the legate in charge of a legion that was loyal to Antony and persuaded the man to hand over control to himself. So with Cicero minor in control of one of the legions that was supposed to aid him, Gaius Antonius found himself as a would-be governor without the army that he thought he would have to take power. This contributed in large part to Gaius Antonius' defeat and imprisonment at the hands of Brutus. Marcus, therefore, had really found a purpose and had succeeded brilliantly. He was on a path, and he had contributed in a way that was very helpful to the Senate. With Gaius Antonius defeated and then Dolabella defeated in Syria, Antony was on the ropes at Mutina, where he was surrounded by enemies and about to fall. However, it was at this moment when Antony was at, on the back foot that he proved that he had more moxie than people gave him credit for, and he joined forces with Octavian and Lepidus to form the Second Triumvirate. Each of the members of the Triumvirate had the ability to name men they wanted to be taken out by prescription, men who had to die, and as part of the compromise, each man was willing to give up on some of the people in his own camp if those people were offensive to his new colleagues. Mark Antony demanded the death of all of the Cicerones, especially, of course, Cicero the Elder. And this led to the execution of the Cicerones. Famously, Cicero the Elder, for once in his life, showed physical courage and stood up and invited his would-be executioner to slit his throat and be done with it. Marcus, safe in Greece, received the news that the three men closest to him in this world, his father, his uncle, and his cousin, had all been prescribed and executed. We don't know exactly how he felt in that moment, and we actually never really see Marcus's own words, except for the one letter where we have a few fragments or quotes that, from what he said to his father. But we can easily imagine his pain and anger. And so for the rest of his life, at least the parts of his life that we know about, Cicero the Younger would be determined to avenge the death of his family. Despite having cleverly commandeered an entire legion without a fight, Cicero the Younger was not bound to hold a senior command at Philippi. The liberatories were extremely rank conscious as their Pompeian predecessors had been, and so Marcus, who had never been in the Senate, was not able to hold any more senior a command than the one that he had held as a teenager. And so now at age 22 or 23, he once again found himself in command of a small cavalry unit in Brutus's army. Once again, we don't have very many details, but we know that he performed well in a losing effort and that he fought in a way that people respected. Brutus, of course, committed suicide after the battle was lost, or at least he perceived it to be lost. And after his suicide, Marcus was able to secure a pardon from Octavian and Antony, and then returned to Rome. Most likely, this is because Antony's anger at Marcus's father had abated, and Antony was also willing to recognize and reward valor. He was a man who was also very physically brave, so the fact that young Marcus had fought bravely perhaps impressed him. Also, Octavian was about the same age as Marcus Cicero the Younger, and so perhaps the two of them were able to strike up some sort of friendship. It's also likely that Octavian felt guilty about having uh, allowed Cicero Minor's father to be executed the way that he was. At any rate, whatever the motives of the two victorious generals, they decided that Marcus Cicero the Younger could come home and resume his life. Once he was back in Rome, Cicero Minor found himself being courted by Octavian. Whether Octavian felt genuine guilt for having betrayed his father, or whether he simply wanted a reliable ally, is unclear and unknowable. 
We, of course, have no idea what advice, if any, Marcus ever offered up to Octavian, although we do know that he must have had plenty of chances to do so. We also don't know for sure if he was ever quite in the inner circle around Octavian, the people that he tended to consult on major decisions. However, there is some evidence based on Cicero's governorship in Syria later that Octavian did value his counsel and that perhaps Cicero Minor was either in the inner circle or the outer circle of Augustus. But again, we can't quite tell. Certainly, he was not on the same level as someone like Agrippa. That much is clear. We also know that Octavian very much enjoyed Marcus's witticisms at banquets. Marcus was famous for being an entertaining and enjoyable companion, and so Octavian liked having him around. This is also a way for Octavian to visibly demonstrate that he was loyal to the memory of the man who had been his patron, Cicero the Elder. Octavian later arranged for Marcus to be elected to the College of Augurs and also sponsored his candidacy for a number of offices, meaning that the younger Cicero would advance to the Cursus of Norum a little bit faster than what was expected. So while he doesn't advance nearly as quickly as, say, the imperial princes of the Julio-Claudian period a bit later, he does advance a little bit more quickly than he should if one is following the soul and curses of Norum to the letter. It's possible that Cicero Minor was present at the Battle of Actium, where Mark Antony's fleet was destroyed and his hopes went up in flames. At any rate, Cicero Minor was back in Rome in 30, where he was presiding as consul, and the news that he had been waiting for finally came. Mark Antony and Cleopatra were dead. The war was over. For Marcus Tullius Cicero Minor, this was especially welcome news, as Antony had been the man who had been responsible for his father's death. As his colleagues applauded, knowing how much this meant to him, the consul, Cicero Minor, posted the notice of Antony's death to the same speaker's platform where Antony had posted his father's tongue and hand years before. Later that year, Marcus presided over the Senate as it officially condemned Antony's memory by removing all of his statues and revoking all of his honors. The Senate even went so far as to forbid future members of the Antonius line from taking the personal name Marcus. So after this, it would be all Lucius and other names. According to Plutarch, this was poetic justice for Cicero, and we can imagine that Cicero Minor probably felt the same way. It felt like at long last his father could rest easily knowing that the man he hated the most was dead alongside of him. For Cicero Minor, though, his career wasn't over yet. He still had another major task ahead of him. With the passing of Mark Antony, the greatest challenge of Octavian's life was over. However, that does not mean that his work was done. There was still much to be done to transform the Republic into the Empire and create a stable social order. In order to do that, Octavian needed reliable and capable people at his side. He apparently regarded Cicero Minor as such a person. After presiding over the celebration of Octavian's victory, Cicero Minor packed his bags and headed out to Syria, where he assumed the proconsular governorship. This was not an easy assignment. For starters, Syria had, was on the frontier, and Crassus's defeat at Carai had never been properly avenged. If anything, Antony had added to the shame by getting defeated himself when he tried to invade Parthia. This was still a recent memory, and in fact, it was Antony's defeat at the hands of Parthia that gave Octavian the opening that he needed to resume the war and finish off Antony and Actium. So there was the possibility of a war breaking out with Parthia. To add to that, the legions under Cicero Minor's command were all units that had served under Antony and might be unhappy with the change in leadership. While they were certainly happy to receive a paycheck from Octavian, this does not mean that they were fully loyal as of yet. And so Cicero Minor was in a difficult and potentially delicate situation. Octavian clearly must have trusted this man's administrative skills and his loyalty 
I say loyalty in this case because he was putting him in charge of legions that might not be 100% loyal. And so he knew in his heart of hearts that Cicero Minor would do his duty and would settle Syria in a way that would make it safe. And so far as we can tell, we have few details, but Cicero Minor seems to have done just fine. In fact, he seems gen to be generally regarded as a relatively capable administrator. Although Cicero Minor was clearly capable and successful, this does not mean that his personal life was anything approaching happy or healthy. So far as we can tell, based on the limited evidence, the man had become a hopeless alcoholic by around the same time that he was governing Syria. He had developed a reputation for getting blackout drunk at parties and for sometimes making scenes. Now, whether this was an occasional thing or whether it was more frequent, we don't know. We only have the attestations of the times where things got out of hand. For instance, at one party, the normally agreeable Marcus hurled a goblet at Agrippa. Apparently, this incident was brushed aside and everybody moved on. But something like that could result in a blood feud. Roman aristocrats were notoriously thin-skinned, and things like that could have gotten much worse. However, given that Cicero the Younger and Agrippa were both generally known as being relatively easygoing guys, I'm sure they were able to patch it up. There's another incident that is a little more concerning. While he was serving in the East, presumably while he was still governor of Syria, Marcus was presiding over a banquet, and he was discussing something with a guest. And because he was so incredibly drunk, he always forgot the man's name and had to ask him seven or eight times. And so when he forgot the name again, his servant told him that the man was named Cestius and that he said that Marcus's father was a poor orator and writer. The younger Cicero took umbrage at this and decided to prove that his father was in fact not a poor writer by having the man whipped on the spot. This became a minor scandal, but certainly was not something that would be career ending as it was not uncommon for people to get drunk at banquets and do regrettable things. Although at this point in his career as a consular, this was something that would have been embarrassing. So again, we don't know exactly how much Marcus was in the bottle, but it is clear that he did have a problem with alcohol. Whether he was getting drunk every day or whether he simply couldn't drink without getting hammered, we simply don't know. He's last attested in 28, still serving as governor in Syria. And so far as we know, he never had any children. So after him, there are no more Ciceros so far as we can tell. And that ends his story. Cicero Minor is not one of the great Romans. To put it simply, Cicero Minor is not his father. However, he is still important in his own right, and we can learn a good deal by studying him. For instance, most of what we know about aristocratic Roman childhood is about Cicero Minor. Due to his father's writing, we have a pretty good picture of what a child's life was like if they were born into a senatorial family. So if you were to look up studies of Roman childhood as they pertain to members of the upper class, you will notice that most of the footnotes ultimately lead you back to Cicero's letters where he refers to his son. He also is a bit more typical of your average Roman senator than most of the great Romans you can learn about by reading Plutarch's biographies. If you read one of Plutarch's biographies, you're reading about someone who was born to be an overachiever, someone who not only was in a position to achieve power, but had the personal drive and motor to want to seek greatness, someone who had the eye of the tiger. Cicero Minor was not that sort of man. He was content with being just one of the members of the Senate. That was not something that bothered him. He didn't have the overwhelming drive of someone like Caesar who couldn't sit still at a gladiatorial event because he was too busy reading reports and politicking. I think it might be a bit harsh to call him a mediocre slacker, but that's what I'm going to do because it's already written on the screen. And also, I mean, let's face it, uh, comparatively, he was. He's certainly not on par with Caesar or Sertorius or even his own father. 
Most of the offices and honors that Cicero Minor received were primarily due to the patronage of Augustus. That being said, obviously Cicero Minor did pull some weight. He served as governor in Syria and did a good job. But nonetheless, he very much was pulled along by Augustus and became part of the new Senate that Augustus built around him, where he would have men who owed their entire careers to him. Cicero Minor had one of the more famous names among that group of men, and to be fair, due to just the fame of his name alone and his ability to be at least a commander on some level, he probably could have made it legitimately in the Republic if it were competitive, at least the office of Praetor and perhaps even the Consul. But again, he never had a chance to do that because the Republic was effectively dead by the time that he was of office holding age. On a more somber note, Cicero Minor is also an example of a Roman elite who fell prey to alcoholism. And unlike many other figures in Roman history, we actually probably have a pretty good idea of why he drank. We know that he felt like he was a disappointment to his dad. We know that he was third in affection to his sister and to his cousin in his father's eyes. And we also know that being a, having his father's approval was something that mattered to him a lot. We also know, of course, that he lost his family at a young age. And so when we think of the reasons why people might drink, we can actually identify with Cicero Minor. If we were in his shoes, we might very well also seek to drown out our sorrows in wine. With other Romans, we simply don't know why they drink. And so people tend to be judgmental about that. But with Cicero Minor, it's hard to do that because we have a pretty good idea of what's going on with him. And because we don't know of him having any children or him being married, it also makes it seem like perhaps his life might have been a little bit sadder than we're giving credit for. We just don't know. So that's why I believe that Cicero Minor is a mildly tragic figure. While he was able to move on from his family's annihilation, he didn't move on on the inside. And it's clear to me, at least, that he was never very happy, even if he did have external success. But let's move on to someone else, because this is starting to get a little depressing. Until next time, I'm Thersites the Historian.